Hey friend, it's Matt Potratz here. I've been thinking a lot lately about a term that that I guess uh, really crosses my mind quite often. And it's the idea of salvation. Us church people use that term a lot. And over the years I've heard so many times people say things like, he needs to get saved or she just needs to find salvation in Jesus in their high and mighty religious tone. And I think for the most part, whether Christian or not, people associate salvation as being the way to heaven. And it is. But what does salvation mean and, and how do I achieve it? First off, you don't achieve it. You receive it because it's a gift from God. In the Bible, the Apostle Paul writes in his letter to the Romans that it's a free gift from God. And we can't earn or achieve free gifts. In Romans chapter 6, verse 23, you'll find Paul's writing says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. But the free gift of God, he says. And, and that gift of eternal life doesn't just begin when we die. It begins the minute we say yes to Jesus here on earth, and then goes on for eternity in heaven after death. Most people are familiar with the, um, I guess you call it the most famous verse in all of Christianity, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that everyone who believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. So there it is again, the promise of eternal life in Jesus. And again, eternal life is for eternity, but it starts now, not after death. If that's true, then salvation is not just to keep me out of hell. So in a few minutes on this podcast... I want to answer some questions before I share the simplicity of how to find salvation, secure your spot in heaven, and begin your eternal life now. You might first need to answer one or all of these questions. First is, what are we saved from? Secondly, what are we saved to? And lastly, who saves us? So first, what are we saved from? The Bible speaks of our salvation in a bit fuller terms than simply being rescued from hell. Sure, the primary focus of salvation in the Bible is salvation from eternity in hell. But Jesus also talks a lot about finding life in Him. Springs of living water. In John chapter 14, Jesus describes Himself as the way, the truth, and the life. And in John chapter 10, Jesus recorded saying that Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come to give you life and give it more abundantly. Therefore, salvation in Jesus is also freedom from the mundane, purposeless life, full of lies from the evil one about our worth, and instead it's an abundant life full of truth in the Bible about our value. Which begins to answer the next question, what are we saved to? Repurposing old furniture and decor has become kind of a, a pretty popular thing these days. It's, it's a good mind picture for our lives, though. When a person sets out to take a dumpy old table and make it shine again, they take possession of it, change it substantially, and repurpose it to be of good use. Some people think of salvation merely as God cleaning our slates, offering forgiveness, and giving us a second chance, which is all true. But it's so much more than that. Salvation is not only being saved from something, it is also being saved to someone. I'll say it again, it's being saved to someone. We're saved from our sin... Brought to God, He restores and repurposes us, and we begin new. We don't just accept the reality there's a God and choose to believe. We're brought to the personhood of God, to relationship with God, to the abundant life that Jesus promised. Does that mean life becomes easy with no more sorrows or trouble? Pfft, absolutely not. What it means is that no matter what the conditions are, you always have God by your side to lean on, to confide in, and a source of strength for you. You're not saved to church. You're saved to relationship with God. Church is merely the opportunity to be with like-minded people and have genuine relationships to share your life with. It really is that simple. But now let's answer the question, who saves me? In the Bible, Paul writes in the fifth chapter of his letter to the Romans, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. So we're saved from the wages of sin and made right with God by faith in Jesus. 
So Jesus is the answer to the question, who saves me? But but why? Why Jesus? Well, to answer that question, we have to rewind back to God's creation. When God created humans, we were perfect in his eyes. In fact, the Bible even says that we were created in his likeness. Some translations say we are made in his image. I'm not sure if that means we physically look like God because I can't possibly believe we could be anywhere near as glorious and beautiful, but we're the most complex and beautiful creatures in all of creation because we are most like our creator. When he placed us perfect on this earth, his rules in the Garden of Eden were simple. Don't eat the forbidden fruit, just one fruit. You can eat all the rest. It's kind of like we tell our kids, don't eat the yellow snow. Pretty simple, right? But it wasn't. It just felt so right because they might be missing out on the best fruit in the garden. What felt so perfect ended up being mankind's first imperfection. So now we're not perfect in God's eyes. We continue to sin from that point forward. But here's the good news. Though not perfect, we're accepted in God's eyes. He created us in His likeness. With Him, we work from approval, not for approval. I want to say that again. With God, you work from approval, not for approval. No extra special work you can do can make Him love you more. You're accepted. You're approved. You can get closer to Him for sure, but He can't love you more because His love for you is already off the charts. But because we are not perfect and God is perfect, we couldn't really access God. We put up that barrier of imperfection between a perfect creator and an imperfect creation. Over time, it broke God's heart as the world became plagued by sin and corruption. God chose to allow humans to sacrifice the most valuable piece of livestock in the herd as a sacrifice to cover our sin. Valuable animals were placed on large stakes and fully burnt over open flame as a sacrifice to God to say sorry for their sin. God essentially forgave their wrongdoing in exchange for the death of something of value being offered up to Him. That's where Jesus comes in. To fill that gap for our imperfection, God offered his own son to stand in that gap, to hang on the cross or a stake and die as ultimate sacrifice once and for all. Mankind literally couldn't make enough sacrifices to keep up with our sinful behavior. God simply says if we believe in the sacrifice of his own son, no more sacrificial offerings are needed. The best part is that he first sent Jesus into our world to be born as a baby, grew up as a boy, and to live as a man. He experienced our world exactly the way we experience it, the same pain, the same stress, the same struggles, the same highs and the same lows. He humbled himself to be a man while on this earth. The Apostle Paul shares in the Bible in the book of Philippians chapter 2 that although he was God, he didn't walk through our world as God. He felt it the way that we feel it. You'll find it in Philippians 2 uh, verses 6 through 8. It says, Though he was God, He did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges, took the humble position of a slave, and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Through Jesus, we can access God. His life sacrificed has been and always will be enough for us to have a real, vibrant relationship with our Creator, regardless of our imperfections. Jesus put heaven in touch with earth. When you pray, when you cry, when you laugh, when you hurt, he gets it. He lived it. He suffered human pain when they mocked him, beat him, whipped him, and drove big metal spikes through his hands that hung him on a wooden cross to die that painful death. And probably the best part about what Jesus accomplished is he didn't just die. Three days later, he rose again so that we get to rise again too. We get to die to our sin, die to our old self, and rise up a new person. Okay, so now we know what we're saved from, what we're saved to, and who saves us. But before I close these thoughts, we need to answer one last question. How do I actually get saved? How do I secure my spot in heaven? I've always been taught that we must say the quote-unquote sinner's prayer, and that there are some very specific items that prayer must include. But when I set course to become a pastor and teach the Bible, I began to study the Bible more in depth. And I can tell you that, honestly, you won't find a sinner's prayer anywhere in it. 
There aren't specifics. There aren't special requirements. There's only surrender or giving up lordship of your life. Are you still lord of your life? Or are you willing to let Jesus be lord of your life? Who gets to call the shots? And as you surrender to and, and talk to Jesus either deep in your spirit or even out loud, you begin to get closer to him and feel his presence in your daily life. Don't try to follow a list of do's and don'ts. Just get closer to Jesus. How, you might ask? Read what he said. Read about what he did. Read about who he was. The first four books of the New Testament of the Bible are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, referred to as the Gospels. They're all accounts of the life of Jesus, all from different perspectives, but all accurate accounts of his life while he was here on earth. And as you read them, you'll learn more about the life he lived as an example of the life we should live. I love what pastor and author James McDonald defines as one of the biggest myths in all of Christianity. He says this, the closer I get to God, the more righteous I become. Myth. James goes on to say, the truth is, the closer I get to God, the more aware of my sin I become, and I'm reminded of my need for a Savior. So don't stress about the do's and don'ts of being a Christian, about becoming righteous or perfect. Just focus on knowing Jesus more, and He'll bring conviction in your spirit when your behavior doesn't please Him. And slowly but surely, the do's and don'ts are really of no concern because your life is in the process of lining up with His will for you. And keep in mind, it's a journey, not an event. It's a journey that you'll be on for as long as you live. A journey to get closer to God through Jesus. And it will be a more fulfilling life than you could ever create on your own. You'll still live. You'll still have fun. You'll still enjoy life. And in the middle of it, you'll still face struggles too. But you'll do it all while in a walking, talking, moving relationship with the creator of the universe. So right now, no matter where you're at, think about it. Maybe you're saying, I believe all this. I want to start living this life of a surrender to God, but I don't know how. And it's this simple. Just simply say, yes, Jesus, today is my day. Be Lord of my life. And that's it. That's how your journey toward Jesus begins. Your life will never be the same. Then find a church or Bible study in order to find, build relationships that you need and learn more about who God wants you to be. But no matter what, securing your spot in heaven is as simple as remaining surrendered to Jesus. You'll screw up, probably every day. But just pray and ask forgiveness and move forward on your journey toward Jesus. I'm sure I know some of you, but I'll likely never meet many of you while on this earth. But I'll see you in heaven someday, and I can't wait to hear about how Jesus changed your life. I'll leave you with one last thing today. It's a common farewell used in the Old Testament days when people were leaving camp and barking on a journey. In the book of Numbers, chapter 6, verse 24 through 26, you'll find these words. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you favor and give you his peace. Stay on the journey, friend. It's life-changing.